Um, if that's okay, I will sort of reintroduce the day that the morning it, we're going to have. We we just asked for a bit of feedback on the training at the weekend. There doesn't seem to many, be any questions at the moment, but please do put them on the chat um, as we go along if you have any thoughts. So um, we, we're lucky to have Will with us again this morning, who's going to go through a talk which was um, created some years ago by a, uh, a, a project will we'll tell you a bit more about it but we have been given permission to record it and put up put it up on the the um the website provided that we create a link to its creators so we do have permission to show it and, and record it so it will be going up on the website later on um so without further ado i will hand you over to will and uh on his uh identifying amphibians talk thanks will okay. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, this talk was first sort of aired in 2015 for the um, Freshwater Habitats Trust's um, PondNet um, project, um, which looked at eDNA and amphibian distributions right across the country. And um, like our project, it was funded by the Heritage Lottery. Um, I have actually adapted it a little bit just to um, make it a little bit more locally focused um, and added a few of my own pictures but it's basically based upon that um, off the peg presentation so without further ado um, th these are the particular species that they were looking for and they're also um, important for us. Uh, great crested newts are a priority because they're um, a European protected species, they're protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and they are our rarest newt. Um, the common toad is um, a biodiversity action plan species and it's one that's known to be declining declining so if it was a bird it would be in the on the red list you might say um so it's, it's one that w we like to um pay particular attention to but there are, of course there are other native species as well and they will be covered in the presentation um just so that you um get an idea of some of the other species that are found in the united kingdom but not in herefordshire um, there is the um, very rare Natterjack toad and they are tend to be now confined to coastal sites like sand dunes, they've got quite specific requirements. They're the only native toad in Ireland and if you find one it would be, <laughs> it would make national headlines, put it that way. So we're not expecting um, to find Natterjack toads. Um, so without further ado again we'll look at the common frog. Okay, uh, yeah frogs um, have got smooth skin. They also um, are extremely agile and um, I don't know if you can see the point but the front forelimbs are, are quite swollen in frogs actually. Um, and we just move on to the next one because that shows the um this is the ear, ear drum you can see where the red arrow goes um and that's quite prominent you won't see that in toads um they're extremely variable in color and um yeah we, we'll see that next um it's interesting <laughs> yeah and some other features that I often see anyway, I'll point them out, is often get stripes along the rear legs here. Um, as you say, smooth, smooth skin. There's no um, sort of toxic glands. They're, they're little um, bumps that you'll get on the toad. So you've got a very nice smooth skin. You've also got more of a pointed uh, head here. So it's in uh, toads it's even blunter actually but we'll see that in a minute um right um 
I think we've got an extra slide there. But this is, uh, this is color variation, which you can see is quite extreme. So, you know, you'll be excused in a way for thinking that there are, you know, you're looking at different species because the colors can vary just so much. Um, don't so often see these extreme, these are actually extreme color forms. I quite often see the one on the top, top right, those sort of colors and the one below it. But the red ones, um, there's quite a lot of females in populations that are quite red. That's, that's definitely quite an extreme variation of that. Um, but the thing to bear in mind in terms, in terms of frogs, you know, we've only um, got the one, uh, well, apart from the, the, the pool frog, which is a, spe a special case, We've only really got the one species anyway, and we don't we don't have pool frogs in in Herefordshire. Um, yeah, the, I mean sometimes you also get albino frogs as well. I mean I have seen them with red eyes, but um, I've been looking at them for you know <laughs> thirty years, and I've um, I've only um, twice seen an albino frog. So you know some of these. Color variations are quite rare. Um, in terms of frog breeding, you tend to get, you know, big accumulations of frog. And like all amphibians, they're far more active at night time. Uh, some of you at Moccas, on, certainly on the Saturday, the, um, you went over to the lawn pool and they, uh, the frogs were calling in broad daylight. Um, because they were actively engaged in courtship, um, you know, laying spawn in day daylight. Often the, if uh, they get particularly excited and get carried away, they continue that, uh, continue their breeding in, 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 in daylight, you know, the, the um, sort of natural um, urge to, to, to breed is so strong that they will, um, e even though they might be under threat from other predators, they'll, they will um, continue that but if they hear something they'll all go quiet again and then they'll start up again you, you often find that in fact we went back to the lawn pool at Moccas and they're all quiet again um, I think what one thing to point out um, uh, we haven't got any recordings but the the, um, the the frogs have actually got sort of more of a, um, a purring um, sound sometimes like a lawnmower some people say so it's quite low pitched but when you listen to common toads, they're actually high pitched. Um, yeah, they, they can be found in a pretty wide variety of, of, of ponds. And often you get large accumulations where, um, you know, conditions, are, obviously where conditions are right. Um, but also that, you know, they're going to be found in garden ponds. Um, Sometimes people worry because um, they've had them in their garden pond and then they disappear. But I think that's quite, quite normal. They, they, well, in a small pond, um, you know, if, if you get uh, disease and things, you know, if it's prone to disease, um, if they continue breeding in that small pond, um, they're going to be particularly susceptible um, to diseases and things. So they, it's quite normal for them to to breed in your garden pond, you know, maybe, maybe for eight years or something like that. And then they'll stop and they'll move to another site. Um, so um, we're right in the peak of the frog breeding at the moment. So um, it really is the right time of year to go, to go and look for them. And um, of course you don't have to see the actual adults to know that you've got um, common frogs. Um, we can just identify them by the spawn um, just using one of the other slides that they've got, there, there are other species, but it's extremely rare to find non-natives. Perhaps I should just, um, I haven't really been given the opportunity, but perhaps I should say that in terms of our native species, you'll probably know this, but it's um, common frog, common toad, and then three species of newt. So that's um, great crested newt, palmate newt, and smooth newt. And then um, only relatively recently, um, we've got a seventh species in Norfolk called the pool frog. 
um, from the, 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 the um, Norfolk Suffolk border area. Um, but it was only known from one site. And, um, but in terms of non, non-natives, um, we've got we, several species that have turned up. Um, the bullfrog is a prolific breeder um, from North America and um, it um, has these enormous tadpoles um, and it has uh, it has been found in several ponds within the United Kingdom but we the, the authorities make sure that if it is found and reported that they um, take action and remove them from those ponds. So I don't think we've had any recent occurrence because it's kind of been stamped down a bit on having this species. It used to be a popular in the pet trade, um, but of course people would just empty their um, contents of their uh, aquariums out into the garden pond. And that causes, you know, could cause massive problems. Can you see it's a very large, um, uh, a frog and it would it would it would um, uh, replace our native populations if it was given the opportunity to do so. Um, just moving on. Um, the the other frogs that you could see um, are the um, green or water frogs. They call them water frogs, I think now, and. Um, they're native to Central Europe. Um, in fact, the pool frog is, is a member of our water frog. So it's, it's likely that, that, you know, there were established populations of, um, um, of marsh frogs uh, uh, present. So, you, so you've basically got um, two, two species in the hybrid of, 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 of these. So, so mar marsh and pool frog. Yeah, so let's get this right. Pool frog was our was our native one. There was marsh and pool frog. We we we, we apparently never had native marsh frog, um, but in Europe you get marsh frog, um, pool frog, and the hybrid, which is the edible frog. Um, but people again um, have got these in the pet trade, and they've released them. Um, and I have been to a site in Herefordshire where they were released, uh, site in Madley. Um, I don't think there were very many of them because all, all I, I couldn't really get a, a visual sighting of them, but I heard them calling. Um, they basically, believe it or not, they sound a bit like a duck. They have a sort of quacking sound um, and they breed later in the season. So it's late spring to summer is so it's, it's when they breed. Um, there's a chap at Bodenham who used to breed them and he had in, in his garden pond. And I think Nigel Hand been round and, um, and, and seen or heard them there. So it is possible that you might see them. I was trying to move it on, it's a bit sluggish. Um, the common toad, um, I think you can notice on, on the, this one with the head that it's, it's very flat. You know, it's not as pointed as the frog. I mean, I think most of you all know about the warts. These are the, the um, uh, toxic glands that contain bufotoxin. Um, and it's generally far less agile than uh, the common frog. The only the juvenile toads um, can sort of hop you know take off basically um but the the adults they're far too heavy and bulky to to hop so they've got a totally different movement different gait um when they move so you should be able to instantly recognize um a frog or a toad in the field just just by looking at it and how it moves and things um yeah the the, the forearms are narrower um, we just move, we should move on to the next one to show this. Um, oh, it's not. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, this is the, um, 
gland here that uh, specifically produces toxins. Um, and uh, it's usually accompanied by this sort of, it sticks out a bit, you know, like a half crescent moon. Um, the eyes are often coppery as well. Uh, so that they're, they're, they're sort of more red than, uh, than the uh, common frog eyes. Um, and uh, their um, <laughs> breeding techniques are somewhat different as well. You often get these um, congregates, these balls, so it's basically male toads that are um, trying to mate with a, a female. Um, and their sort of clasping is called amplexus. So they're basically clasp onto anything um, that they, you know, in the breeding season, um, including fish. And um, even if you dip your foot in there, they'll clasp on that. Um, we know that they're breeding now um, because we've got reports. Well, we've certainly got reports of large numbers going down to Bodnam Lake. I have looked at some other sites and I haven't, actually in one of the other pools, I didn't see any. So it's a bit of a mixed picture at the moment. That's probably because we've had some cold weather. Um, like frogs, they need it to be relatively warm. It's not just day length, they need it to be relatively warm and moist before, uh, you know, damp, damp conditions just after rain is a very good time for them to move. So it's usually about 10 degrees um, when they start migrating towards the ponds for breeding. Um, so we've had a few nights like that. Um, night before last was um, pretty good. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen fresh frog spawn. But so far, <laughs> I haven't seen any toads, but uh, um, probably in the next couple of days at this, the other pool I'm looking at, it's actually at Barrington Hall. So I'm hoping to maybe um, capture, you know, see, see some there. Um, in terms of our sites, I mean, we were just discussing that Giles heard a toad at Moccas. Um, but I'm not sure whether that's a, really big breeding site or whether it's just one or two there. Um, the best time to go and see is at night time because that's when they're most active because they they migrate to the ponds at, at night not during the daytime although it's not impossible to see them during daytime but they're usually hidden away. Um, so just looking at both spawn now um, you can see on the left this is um, frog spawn um, but there's a string of toad spawn that's actually mixed in with it. Um, and then on the right um, is a string of toad spawn. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're very different. I mean, it's actually really easy for us in the United Kingdom to do these types of surveys because we have so few species, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, in Herefordshire, so I should say, we've... Um, yeah, we've only got the, the, the five species and um, uh, so, so that if you're in Europe, there'll be all sorts of different types of frog spawn that you're trying, you know, you're trying to distinguish. Um, I mean, it's possible very, you know, it's very, it's very possible to, to do the same thing in Europe, but, it, you know, you need to be aware of all the other species. But here we've got relatively few, so it's pretty easy. Um, and you know that you know we know when we see this that we've got frog, a common frog, Rana temporaria, temporaria because it likes temporary ponds, and um, the, the common toad bufo bufo. Uh, again, with the tadpoles, the same thing applies. Um, we we can tell what species by just simply by looking at the tadpoles. Um, what what. What we do need to say though is when the, when the um, spawn hatches, they actually look just dark black and they look very similar. But as they develop, you know, within a, take about two, two to 
three months to develop to what we call metamorph when they leave the ponds. Um, this is on the left is the common frog tadpole, which has got this speckling, these golden speckles underneath. Um, the speckles go into the um, tail flap here. Um, the common toad is more rounded. It's jet black. Um, it doesn't have much skin uh, along the tail. This would be muscle here. Um, so it's got less of a, of a, of a skin flap. Um, and none of the sort of golden fleck, uh, this fleckling uh, mottled. So very capable of identifying, you know, it's, it's very possible. It might be easier if you caught them, if you're just a little bit unsure, because often, I mean, this is an excellent photograph, incidentally taken by Phil King, who's a member of Heart, Hereford Amphibian and Reptile Team. Um, so if the light's in the wrong direction, you might not be able to distinguish them too easily. So sometimes netting them is, helps, it even helps me sometimes when they're smaller. Um, this is um, a shoal of uh, common toad tadpoles and you notice just how black they are. And this is typical of toads because they shoal. And the other thing that uh, you notice is that they will move around the pond at certain times of day. And experts, I suppose like myself also, have noticed that they will move around the pond to move to the warmest part of the pond during the day. So as the sun moves around, they'll move around with it. So you might go to a pond, oh God, there's no toad tadpoles here. They should, there should be millions of them. And then you walk around one area and there they all are. Um, so yeah, they, they, they're pretty well adapted. Um, common frog tadpoles will congregate, but they don't tend to move too far from where they were hatched um, and then they will go and feed on algae um, and then as they develop they become more interested in being carnivorous and um, uh, feeding on uh, things that have died in the pond for instance they're quite happy to I mean in fact if, if, if other tadpoles and frogs die they'll you know they'll recycle that um, protein basically. Um, right, well, I'm going to move on to the newts now. Um, and their breeding is very different. Um, so so new, this is, a, these are, um, hmm, yeah, breed, breeding uh, uh, smooth <laughs> newts. And you'll notice that the eggs are laid singularly on um, aquatic vegetation. Um, well, you will notice if I put the slide up. Um, now, um, it, it, if we take you out to look at um, amphibians, um, this is the technique we'll be showing you. Um, it's basically they've wrapped this and it looks like it's kind of been snipped off or something. So you've got a straight line. You can see that straight line on the top. Um, but if you unwrap it, you can see the egg underneath. And like I say, because we've got so few species, we know that because just because of the colour of that egg, that it's going to be great crested newt. It's the colour and slightly also the size, because it's got this sort of, I don't know whether you call this albumin, but it's the, the, the sort of jelly bit. I, I'm sure, it, yeah, I'm sure it is. So you've got the albumin here and it's slightly longer than the smooth newt. So there's more of the jelly bit and the egg is just slightly bigger and it's creamy white. And so if you've got a smooth or palmate newt, um, they're sort of buff colored. And actually you can't tell the difference between smooth and palmate newt eggs, but you can spot great crested newts. Um, as to where they lay their eggs, um, we, we mentioned, um, we were talking about um, water forget-me-not, the one on the top left is water forget me not. And you can see it's folded not once, but folded twice. Um, 
I think the next one on the right, top right, is float grass. It certainly looks like it, and that would be very typical. Uh, float grass, Glyceria fluitans is very, very common around ponds. In fact, if you're at the linear pond at Moccas, uh, the grass on the top of that was float grass, um, and they like to lay on that. Um, it's just it just suits them basically. The one on the bottom here is just <laughs> is actually um, hawthorn. Um, I think it's just to show that they'll lay on anything really that's um, you know that's in the if the pond is flooded a bit and the hawthorn leaves are there, they could lay on that as well. Um, but you're looking for those folds. If you if you notice that the leaves were folded then you know you, you only need to open up one you don't open up them all to check because then you'd be literally killing all the eggs or certainly putting them under a lot of pressure you know they're less likely to survive if you unwrap them but it is it's recognized because they lay maybe a hundred plus eggs it's not going to do any harm to the population um, now as they develop um you get a little new this is the new embryo within the um within the egg sac uh, as it is close to hatching here um they say it's hard harder to identify well perhaps but um um i'd also be more more careful with unwrapping them at that stage because uh, um you know, it might it might might result in them uh, not making it. Um, now, looking at the actual adults, this is the male smooth newt. Um, in terms of size, it grows to about ten centimeters. Um, I think that's four and a half inches, uh, if I remember rightly. I'm I'm only doing that from memory. Um, it has a crest as well as the great crested newt. But it's more of an undulating, bumpy crest. You won't get jag, jagged crest. It's not a jagged crest. Um, the coloration is with a breeding male, you've got you've still got orange on the underbelly. You've got like three colours, whereas the great crested newt is mainly just a two-tone newt, as, as you'll see. And the although the Colours can vary, but you've got these blotches here, um, big blotches um, running down the flank. Um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the flap of skin underneath and on top, but that's quite typical. Now, the only thing with newts is that you have to be bear in mind that they, they show sexual dimorphism, which means variation between males and females. So. You've got to you've got to be familiar with that as well. So, um, so this is also smooth. Newt. It just happens to be the the female, um, and uh, it's got different pattern color. So it doesn't tend to have the blotches. It, the, the 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 flanks that the, the coloration seems to you know is is, is basically a uniform color. So it's a duller than the male. Um, but what you're generally going to get is these spots under the belly. And that tends to be typical of, of, of smooth newt. Um, and um, again, it's um, 10 centimetres. Uh, in fact, they can be, they, on average, they'll be just slightly bigger than the, well, they, yeah, I think they're generally slightly bigger than the, than the males. And um, yeah, you know, there's quite quite su su subtle features. There's a bit of a tail flap there, um, and that is that you will see differences with these and the um, palmates, but they're quite 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 subtle. So I mean, it does sometimes help to have a male if you're just a bit unsure. Um, but we'll come on to some of those other features later and then we're moving on straight away to our iconic species, the great crested newt. And uh, this is um, the one on the left is the great crested newt male. And you'll see instantly that it has a jagged crest here. 
and remember what I'm saying. It's 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 kind of basically dark, um, with, with with just a white, uh, well, with a white tail strip in the male, and uh, orange un underneath. Um, so so it's kind of less colour variation, but a lot darker than the um, the smooth and palmate newts. Um, again, sexual dimorphism. Uh, the female. Um, she doesn't have a crest. Uh, she has this yellow underbelly, um, striking yellow underbelly, warning colour, because these are toxic. These are the bufotoxin glands, those white dots. Um, so, so great crested newts are uh, not, not highly toxic, but they're kind of mildly toxic, uh, whereas there's a smooth newt and palmate newt isn't. Um, so they've all got this warning coloration underneath. And in the female, she has this orange tail strip that runs right away along the length of the tail. Um, I was read, reading from the, <laughs> the notes that here, see if I've missed anything. Um, yeah, the, yeah, there's usually in the male, there's a break here between the tail and the crest. That's, that's quite a typical Great Crest Newt feature. Um, we've got another slide to show. These are ones that weren't harmed in the process. I know, I, I know these were done by my friend John Baker, who was studying great crested newts, and he um, anaesthetised them basically. Um, and you can see the notch there. And um, this is clearly the male. That's the female. I uh, didn't mention size. Actually, up to sixteen centimeters in length so that's kind of six inches so they're much bigger newt uh, obviously much heavier as well the white tail strip that's um, very clearly shown there um, just moving on to the um, palmate newt um, it's got these webbed feet it's got a uh, tail filament here this is the male um, you won't get those in other adult newts. Um, it's also rather boxy in shape. Um, you've got this ridge here, so it's kind of kind of a bit of a square profile in the middle. Um, and it's also got this toffee coloured stripe to the tail. Um, I think some of you may have seen palmate newts actually at Mocker, so if, if you caught a male, you, you know, you still know they're quite different to the um, to the smooth newt. Here's, here's an example of the um, ex the extreme webbing. You're looking at, you know, like a duck's foot, basically, you know, proper webbing. And then there's the close up of the tail filaments. Um, and then we're going to compare with smooth newt. You may get frills, these fr frilly flaps here, but you don't get complete joining in smooth newt. Um, as you say, as I said, the female to the palmate is actually quite similar, um, so they're rather difficult to tell apart. Um, but what we do is we we look under if we've caught one, we look under the chin, and in the smooth newt, you've got um, spots under the chin. Um, in the palmate newt, um, you've got a, um, no spots under the well, you've got no spots on the chin and you've got pale, uh, pale skin. Um, sometimes some smooth newts are very naughty and then they have no, they have no spots under the chin, but they, they, they don't have the pink colour. So you're kind of looking for the pink colour and no spots. Um, other minor features, really, and, you know, um, 10 don't need to jump personally I don't tend, tend to need to look at these features in palmate but they do have um, tubercles um, uh, by the thumb just just beneath the thumb um, or by the wrist um, great crested newts just running through the life cycle um, we've got uh, these are immature great crested newt on the left um, you don't often see those because they're often hidden away. They're terrestrial at that stage. Um, sometimes they go into the water. So sometimes you might find 
uh, a sub-adult great crested newt in the pond. But again, there'll be, <laughs> I'd say, I don't like this photograph, it's overexposed. Again, they would be black. Um, the coloration here is wrong, <laughs> um, but they would be black. Um, another photo by Phil King. Um, as great crested newts hatch, they're very tiny actually, so they're only about just over a centimeter, if that actually, and um, they, you can see they're pretty yellow. Um, the, the smooth and palmate newt got no yellow coloration like that at all. Um, this is as they get larger. Um, you've got these speckles here, black speckles. You've you also got a tail filament, but it's not quite the same as the palmate. And anyway, you're not going to confuse that. And then the smooth palmate newt tadpole, you can't tell the two apart, but you can tell when you've got great crested newt um, because you've got this speckling. You've also got this, uh, this iridescence here, um, but they're going to change as they get bigger. So you've just got to get your eye in for these things and then develop your identification skills as you you know, stage by stage, but you know, it, it's not that difficult in a sense. Um, away from the sometimes you find these metamorphs and then you turn them over and they've got these bright yellow warning coloration. Well, that's great crested newt straight away. Um, the um, smooth and palmates don't have this bright yellow warning color, almost like a tropical amphibian. Um, and then on land again, the adults, um, these are often the tail is curled up. You, I can make out this as a male because it's got the residual crest and it's got a tail strip. And that's the female there, the bottom one. Um, so it's a bit of a line down the um, middle of the tail. But again, jet black. Um, but you can also see the, uh, the warts. That's the other name was the warty newt, um, the old name. Whereas you compare it with a smooth newt, um, it, terrestrial smooth newt, it's got this velvety skin and um, they're generally quite um, sort of brown and fawny coloured. Um, so really quite different. And the palmate newt is not that much different on land, but you know, if you wanted to make sure, you would have to look under the chin, um, which takes a bit of practice. Um, Sometimes smooth newts have got a tail strip, uh, sorry, a, a stripe down the, I didn't mean tail strip, stripe down the middle. Um, other species, if you see grass snake, do let us know. Uh, we'd love to know when we get records. We've only had one during the project so far. Um, a red-eyed terrapin, this is the red-eyed terrapin because of that red stripe. Um, the only reports I'm aware of is from Castle Pool in Hereford. Actually, I think we might have had another record recently, but I can't remember where. But if you do hear about it, let us know, because um, it's always interesting to know they're non-native species. Obviously, the grass snake is a native snake and is very um, attached to water habitats because it feeds on amphibians. Mainly, that's its main prey. Um, Terrapins probably don't breathe in this country, but they do survive. Um, so, they, you know, we, we, ninja turtle phase, the lot got released. I'm just going to very briefly mention about how do we um, survey for um, amphibians. Um, the best method is torching at night time using a powerful torch, um, which we go around the entire margin of the pond if we can. Um, if we can't, then we record how much we've covered. And then we record all the different the, uh, different species. We record frog spawn. We might even record great, great crested newt folds if we see them. Um, and we record the numbers of um, adults within the pond um, as, as far as we can reach. We You have to keep the motion going as you move around because otherwise you'll be counting the same newts or the same um, uh, frogs and toads. So you have to go around the... Uh, you know, slowly walk around the margin of the pond. Uh, the other technique um, is netting, which is very successful. Um, it's slightly um, more impacting because 
you know, you're trampling and you could be trampling on eggs and things like that. Um, so, so it has to be, you know, we, we like, like it to be done in a slightly controlled manner. Obviously, this same net we use for catching aquatic invertebrates as well. Um, but those of us who do it regularly are quite, you know, become quite adept at actually catching um, amphibians using these nets. Um, and then the third method is bottle trapping. And at this point, I need to point out the legal aspects of this because um, bottle trapping actually requires a license for great crested newts. These are great crested newts here that I'm pointing to a younger version of Will. Um, but you need a, first of all, if we're doing surveys for great crested newts, um, that necessitates an educational scientific license. Um, I have one and you can work under my license uh, if you're present, but at the moment you wouldn't be able to go out on your own and look for great crested newts, you know, with the specific purpose of looking for, for them, that would require us to have a blanket license. Um, now, if things progress down that route, we may well try and do something like that. And, you know, if, if, if you become particularly proficient at it, then, then but, you know, Normally when that happens, you know, we, we, we have slightly more training than this, you know, because you definitely need training in the field before you go out on your own and do this, you know. Um, and then if you become really proficient, you want to do this type of work, you can apply for your own license, obviously. OK, well, that's it, basically. Um, just like to say thank you for. Um, they're now the Freshwater ha Habitats Trust. So they've got this is 2015 here. Yeah amphibian and reptile conservation. So it's a combination of their slides. And then we've also used slides from um, these people. And uh, I've added a few as well. Phil King, as I said, was Hereford amphibian and reptile team. Um, and thanks to um, PondNet and um, the Heritage Lottery. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you've got any questions, but perhaps I'll pass back to David. Thank you, Will, that, that was great. Um, yeah, as Will says, Will, this will be uh, credited uh, and up on the website to see for those that want to see it again or those that didn't do. Yeah, that brings another another um, meaning to the word anaesthetized as a newt. <laughs> <laughs> um, bad joke, sorry. Um, yeah, any other any questions from the floor? No. I just want to say you don't uh, have yeah. to be able to identify them in mm. order to complete the survey form. Just in case anyone was really worried, it was because we know that you might see them. We saw some frog spawn. When you've got your net, you might find things. Uh, we hoped you'd find it interesting to have an expert like Will. But I promise I've done the forms. I learned loads today. I can't identify them. It's more for extra support. Although, as Will said, um, if you're really interested, we might be able to try and arrange something so you can go further down that line. But please don't think after today, that's it. We want you to do this, um, just in case you were worried. Question in the chat from Selena. Can the various amphibians cohabit, cohabit a pond successfully? Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends on the size. And in fact, great crested newts slightly tend to, uh, if they really get established, tend to outcompete the other species. Um, we, we know this from experience. So if you're actually counting numbers, um, I have been, and, and I have been to some sites that started off as sort of um, with large populations, uh, especially new sites that started off with large populations of smooth or palmate newts. And then over time, the great crested newts take over and you end up with large populations of, um, of, of great crested newts. Um, but simply because they outcompete the other species. Um, but I guess if a pond dries out, um, it might favour smooth and palmate. And the reason for that is that they require um, two months um, to um, develop from an egg stage to a metamorph when they leave the pond, only two months, whereas great crested newts need three to four months. So they need larger ponds in which to breed. So, um, you know, there is a sort of dynamic, um, but it's not always clear cut. Mm. Ah. A question from 
uh, Stephen, uh, how far did toads and frogs roam? How far will they go to find another pond? Mm. Um, I, I can't give you the accurate scientific um, result of that, but I do know that toads wander further distance than any other of our native ans amphibians. And I believe it's, um, they can wander up to a kilometer away from their breeding sites, um, which is quite, quite a distance. And um, whereas if they've got suitable terrestrial habitat close by, they won't need to wander as far. But it does seem that um, I have heard in talks that there the, the seems to be um, a certain percentage of the population that is not uh, doesn't uh, uh, go back to the breeding pond. They, 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 they're often faithful to, most of the population is faithful to their own breeding pond. But there seems to be sometimes, you know, perhaps in the region of five, 10% that will wander uh, to, toward to another pond. Um, so they're the sort of travel, they're the travelers, if you like, and they like to um, explore and um, go off and find new sites. So it's kind of a, built into their, um, to, you know, to, to, to their lifestyle that, that some members of the population will wander and find new sites. Another one from Selena, uh, do they, um, do amphibians predate on each other? Um, on each yeah. other's spawn specifically? Yes, yes. Um, uh, newts particularly like to um, feed on frog spawn, both great crested newts and smooth newts. Um, I have seen, in fact, I got a photo of a smooth newt sort of diving into frog spawn to to feed on the hatching um, eggs. Um, but it's um, and then if you put them together, so if you put adult newts. If you've got them in aquarium and then you've got adult newts and tadpoles, the adult newts will feed on the tadpoles. And sometimes you've got great crested newts, they'll, they'll even feed on their own kind. Um, but I th think great crested newts would tend to feed on the other species more. So, um, yeah, but that's probably because they lay so much, so many. Um, and not all can make it and um, it's part of their coping mechanism, survival mechanism. Yeah, well, there's a comment from uh, Barbara about um, they have a pond in their polytunnel, very successful, they have uh, froglets living among the crops grown so I suppose it's a form of uh, biological control there, that's really good isn't it? And it's, is that, yeah. um, Barbara, is that sort of, does that how long has that been there? Is it, so are they um, frogs born from from the frogs? That, is it is it sustaining yeah. it sort of thing? It's about three years. Three years now we've had it. That's so really good, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it works really well because they eat a lot of the slugs. We get very few slugs now. Brilliant. I, I don't think I've heard of that actually. No. That sounds really great. Um, yeah. yeah, I like it. Um, um, I mean, I, I know that I have uh, found amphibians in polytunnels, um, but, but um, you know, I haven't heard the, the sort of link between actually having the pond in the polytunnel. Um, you know, we, we found great trusted newts in polytunnels as well, and underneath, um, uh, well, underneath polythene mm. that's been put down and carpet and things. Are they, are they mm. earlier than other the frogs outside, Barbara? <laughs> yes, they're, they're already hatching now. Wow. The, the frog Spawns hatching, and they they spend the winter in the soil. And I know where they are. They've got their little places where they burrow in, and they they're under the soil in the winter. But they came out about um, three weeks ago, and the frog spawns about two weeks now. And it's it's hatching. It's, it's all very exciting, really. Mm. <laughs> the papers come round and have a look to see how. How we're getting on with them. It's, it's, it's little anecdotes like that. It would be really nice for the um, art newsletter. Mm. I'll take some photos. Yes, yes, that'd be, that'd be nice. Very really good. Excellent. Okay, 
any other questions about Will's talk or even, you know, other other aspects of the project? As I say, we're um, we're planning some more dates to, to go out and do more a bit more training. And very soon we'll be um, whittling down the the ponds that we're going to try and visit. So we'll start to uh, to, to be those people that are armed with their their training and their kits. And that's another subject it's about logistics of getting people that are going to go out and survey these ponds, getting the kit to them. So all of this is being is being worked out at the moment. So by the time I guess we can start, Will, would we be starting? surveying in earnest next month um yeah I, I think so yeah yeah so hopefully we'll have we'll um start allocating people ponds and uh landowners to go and visit well hopefully we'll sort it out the landowners by then anything to add to that beth no no nope. nope. uh i hope it that was very interesting i really enjoyed it yeah did you oh good Good. I'm not okay. promising to remember all of it, but I will do my best. Um, very interesting. Yeah, great and stuff. Yeah, we will have more information about how you get your kit and how you find out about your ponds in the next couple of weeks. And yeah. you can start surveying. We're waiting for greenery to grow. Mm. Brilliant. These plants, they're slow. Indeed. They need to be warm. Yeah. Okay, thank you all very much for coming. And 